I'll reveal a little secret on your show for you guys. Oh, we have a lot of investors back. <gasps> Welcome to the Tom Story Show with Steve Karish and Tom Story, where we discuss everything real estate or whatever else is on our minds. Welcome back to the Tom Story Show. We got a repeat guest, a friend of the show, someone we've we had you on like super early in this journey, didn't we, Zen? I think so. I mean, at the time you guys weren't that big and I was the only person you guys could get, right? But now well, I'm just like, oh, nothing's changed, person. man. <laughs> nothing's I, was, I was much bigger back then. Yeah. Steve, <laughs> Steve's lost lots of weight since then. Uh, yeah. Zen joins us from Prime Properties TO. If you don't already subscribe to his YouTube channel, you absolutely must. He's got an extensive knowledge about Toronto real estate and on the new construction side as well. And that's maybe where we're going to spend a lot of this episode because Seems like things aren't going so well. Zen, welcome back, man. How are you? I'm good, man. Thanks for having me back, guys. Good to chat. Yeah. So what's what's uh, the real estate world like for you right now? Quiet. But that's okay. just, you know, summertime. Yeah. But I mean, I think the pre-construction side, I would say, I'm not sure if you're hearing it, but a lot of listing appointments for, hey, can I sell this and make some money back or assign this? I'm like, I'm sorry. Uh, you overpaid 30% for this on what resale is. You can lose your deposit and try to walk away or, you know, by my math, maybe ask the builder to go mutual lease and keep the deposit and try not to close. Is anyone doing that yet? Is anyone going to the builder and saying like, hey, I just want out, keep my deposit. I want to move on. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like I've done the math for some people. Like um, It makes sense. Yeah. So I won't name the building, but let's say you buy for 1600 bucks a foot. Um, it's worth... 11 at most, maybe a thousand. So you're like, and your deposits call it 200 grand. You close on this, you can get a blanket appraisal, but you're minus 2000 bucks a month. You yep. carry this, like what's your projection for, you know, when you can recoup to 1600 bucks a foot or like, you know, $800,000 for one bedroom. I'm like, I don't know, maybe like 2029, we wouldn't have a condo shortage. So that's $2,000 a month, $48,000 a year, sorry, $24,000 a year. And then times like five years, I'm like, you're going to lose your deposit anyways if you carry this. So you want to be released now or not? Is there any conversation with people where it's like, hey, if you're successful in your regular job, not as a real estate investor, and you made a lot of money this year or next year, can selling something like this at a big loss maybe work for you on a tax strategy on a good year and other things you're doing in life? Does that come up at all? Yeah, yeah. So like... um. This one's interesting. You don't sell because obviously when you sell something, you have cap gains to offset it, but you have yeah. no cap gains, right? Right. Or you're not gaining anything. But a lot of people do use the interest because it's so high right now to offset their income. So right? that's so how they're some, looking at it, yeah. Yeah, that's how they justify it, right? So like, you know, you're making 250, but you're bleeding 48. So now you're net before other expenses, like 200. So right off the bat, not tax advice, everybody, but like, yeah. you know, you're saving 25 grand. Well, and it's like these days, if they just got that mortgage at five or six percent, whenever they got it, like we, we talked about this a lot recently, like it is an interest payment anyway. Like the mortgage payment, even if you put twenty percent down, is probably seventy percent interest from day one, if not higher. Oh yeah, easy, easy. If not more, yeah, right? I think it's like seventy three when I calculate a five and a half. At a five and a half with twenty percent down, that's got to yeah. be a thirty year AM, right? Yeah, it's a 30 year. Yeah, that, that I think. Yeah, like, you're not doing this at 25. 25, you're like probably higher. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> oh my God. I mean, listen, is it as bad as we all think it is on the pre con side that we've seen these warning signs? And we already know the condo side of thing for resale is sluggish and things are, are doing what they're doing. Is it is it really as bad as all the YouTube titles say it is? Um, I am guilty of clickbait, partially, but. I would say we don't we don't bad. do that around here, so we don't know what you're talking no. about. Okay, no. all right, okay. No. <laughs> we I think it's bad in a sense where the people who are burnt are gonna be burned or like very, very hard. But there's so much holding power and like prices are sticky on the way down that yeah. it's gonna take a very long time. And I was never really concerned about the cash flow negative because I see so many people carry cash flow negative of high income anyways on the investor side. But what I was really concerned about, like, how the hell are these things going to appraise? 
Mm. I was like, how are you going to appraise, you know, 1600 bucks a foot, $800,000 one bedroom when you can go down the street and buy some for 550 right now. And lo and behold, everyone that comes to me, they're like, I'm good. I called this bank, this bank that is funding the builder. And they gave me an appraisal on what I bought it for. But isn't that I'm terrifying, Zen? That we're doing blanket <sighs> appraisals on things that are not worth anywhere close to what they paid for them just so they can close so that the, the, the developer is not screwed. And isn't that just like another, if, if you're looking at this being, you know, I'm just pushing you because I think it's this is what the comments are, right? Like, <laughs> you know, add this to the list of tools that we're using to make sure that prices don't crash. This on top of the extending amortizations, paying $1 in principle to keep your mortgage. These were things that didn't maybe used to exist the same way they exist now. Yeah, and I think, you know, we're in like a very soft world where everyone needs to be like handheld and losses can't be had. We can't have a recession. And the way I see this, when I even talk to kind of like the people I know on the banking side, they're like, well, it's either you let this giant developer go belly up and it puts giant shockwaves in the real estate world, yeah. or you basically split up the risk onto all your mom and pop buyers. So your 400 unit, you know, pre-construction building, instead of like TD taking a loss, the builder taking a loss, now you're spreading it out, you know, call it half a billion dollars on 400,000 people, which are 400 people. And hopefully like, you know, they take a little bit of loss and it's not as bad or they hold on. Right. And I think that's kind of the calculus that I've made that this will have the least amount of shockwaves in the real estate world and for the economy. Because don't forget, like 8% of our GDP is construction. And if a big builder goes belly up, that's going to have some ramifications for sure. Steve, is anyone even interested in pre-sale in your neck of the woods on the <laughs> west side of, of Canada? Like is, but are you, I know you're not that involved in it, but are you hearing the same stories that people are stuck and closing on things. I've definitely, have I've, had, I've had the phone calls and I haven't taken a single one of the assignment listings and you know, they, I don't, I don't know what they're going to do. I think most people end up closing. Most people end up finding a way to carry it. I haven't heard any crazy horror stories at this point. Um, I just, I mean, every time we have this conversation, which apparently is every single week, uh, <laughs> I just don't see I don't know. I, here, here's where I maybe I want to take this. I, I would never recommend anybody uh, get into that unless they know what the heck they're doing and they're dealing with somebody that's in that space. There was obviously an inflation at a high level uh, in regards to asking prices. But Tom, I, I was sending it to you the other day. I saw uh, a, a video sent to me by a mortgage broker who is showing you how to pay zero down for your new construction condo in today's market. And he went through the whole thing of like, well, obviously you pay 500 K for it now. And by the time you close in three years, it's worth 650. And I was like, that's a pretty big <laughs> assum assumption. Right. And then what you do is you refinance the money out and then you, you, you know, you, uh, your your sticker price is only 500k so then you just 100 percent finance it and i'm like not only does that cash flow negative now uh you're making an assumption that we're going to go up by 30 percent in three years 10 percent a year whatever like it's just it's craziness and until the pre-construction uh the way pre-construction is sold i think we're going to continue to have this problem there there needs to be a solution found for how to finance the buildings other than the way they're financing them Otherwise, this will continue. I don't because now the banks have a vested interest in making sure that place continues as well, right? Hence, blanket appraisals. Yeah, right. Yeah. Like you have to do this like New York style, right? You just have some billion dollar pension fund, hedge fund, build a thing and sell it after, as opposed to actually, you know, offset it to investors that have a five, seven year time horizon, right? Because even if you take all the problems of like cost inflation, tax inflation, and all the other stuff like out of the equation, I don't think after the shockwaves that we saw in the pre-construction world, that many people are going to be interested anymore. Like, I think this is that lesson learned. But I mean, I could be dead wrong because like... No. Well, I'm only for a short period of time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We did we did this in my market in, in 2008, 9, 10 in pre-construction, everybody that, bought, that put down a down payment in 2005, right? They lived it. And then they couldn't sell those things for... Let's, I mean, if they, if they put it down, down payment in 06, they completed in 08, 09, 
they carried those properties till 2017 before they broke even. So, so and there was a lot of guys cash flow negative on those. The problem was then it was a two hundred thousand dollar investment, not a yeah, right, eight six hundred. Tom, when do you think we're gonna hit the prices that people have paid in the downtown for, space? For oh condos? my gosh! I mean, so so here's the thing, right? Hey, real estate agents, I'm gonna ask you a very simple question: Are you proud of your current website? If there was any hesitation in your answer, what I want you to do is go to realtyninja.com slash Tom. They provide amazing websites for the real estate industry at an affordable cost. Steve has been using them for over a decade. Realtyninja.com slash Tom. Like um, as recording this, I've got almost 10 condos on the market for resale, right? So I'm seeing the transaction happening in that side of the business. And what I can tell you, other than a few select, very boutique, I'm not, and I'm not talking about like Yorkville, but like solid buildings that everyone knows about and we know are good buildings. For the most part, if I'm looking at a downtown condo in a good building, in a good area, they're selling for a thousand bucks a square foot, like they did in 2020 and 2019. Like the, yep. the price, it's the, it's the same, right? So if you just think about that, well, like, at the time, maybe at their peak, maybe what you think 2022, we were at like 11, 1150 a square foot for a resale, right? And yep. we've we've kind of come back to a thousand. Well, I guess if you paid 1300 bucks for a downtown condo, you're gonna be okay. Not too like far down the road. Five years? Yeah, yeah probably, five right? Five years, yeah, okay, all right. But if you paid 16, you probably should just give your deposit back and like, honestly. And that's the, the map I did, yeah. It just it makes no sense. I I don't know. Like I know the hype was there and I, I got that people were excited about it, but there's just such a massive gap right now. Um that that's that's sixteen hundred bucks a square foot number. Unless you're going to live there and that's the place you want and, and you got it. if it's an investment, I think it's this what's it's literally the same story Steve just gave. I think you're minimum ten years. Yeah. Are you not? I, I think so too. The example I'll use, and I think you know the building is like sixteen hundred bucks across from Hooker Harvey's. Tom knows exactly what I'm talking about. I actually right? like, the old house I used to live in when we'd order Harvey's. I never realized because we were Uber eating it, it would come from that Harvey's. I'm like, ah, Hooker Harvey's. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, that's the the only other time Hooker Harvey's has come up on this podcast is when we had Brad Lamb on, which is kind of funny. <laughs> You got to date yourself to understand what Poker <laughs> <Harvey> says. <laughs> but like that, that's what scares me, right? Like, look, if you're 1600 bucks Yorkville, sure. Okay, sure. I can see that like a few years. 600 bucks King West, sure. Maybe like a few years. Entertainment District, fine. Give you like seven. But like when you're in like Church Jarvis Corridor, Jarvis, I'm like, yeah. oh, I don't know, man. That's, that's rough. That's rough. Yeah, that one's going to take a long time. Zen, can you do me a favor? Can you just move up a little bit so that me and Steve oh. don't look way taller than you? Oh, I'm sorry. I, uh... I start leaning back. No, no, no. no. It's all back. good. It's more just like uh, you're probably taller than us. I just want you to be relaxed. Like... I'm not worried about what you look like at all. I don't <laughs> just want you to be relaxed. Tom is much more worried about his appearance and, uh, you know, keeping up the high quality. I want of the, the viewers to see your face because they have to look at me and okay. Steve a lot. I'd rather they they see you. It's a, it's a much nicer... Justice. way to look at it and by the way we're not stopping we're just gonna keep going here i just want to oh, no, we're gonna keep going I'm gonna right. also... okay that's fine all right i'm just readjusting my camera so i can see my no, face no. but like i'm, I'm not... fully comfortable I'm in <laughs> well you know right what now. you know what actually can you, <laughs> there you go. i'm gonna start yes, down here i'm good like you know you know what it is like once like you're in a conversation in a yeah. longer like kind of boardroom, I like know. I just lean back. So I was just like moving my mic closer. So I don't just mess up the yeah. audio. <laughs> literally, I used to call it the Suretsky lean back because I know Steve in his videos would literally, <laughs> he didn't have the stand. He'd hold his mic and just lean. And then the last time we had him on, he had a stand. I'm like, oh, you're you're in the same place the whole time. It's weird uh, watching you do it this way. For an hour, he held the mic? He, he used to yeah. do it in all his podcasts. He would hold the mic, the same mic that both of you have. He would just hold it. And I did it once because I forgot my stand. I like my my hand was hurting. Anyways, no way, no way, not 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 that. You know, us poor real estate this. podcasters having to hold the mics. It's a whole thing, but <laughs> but now moving forward. Oh yeah. Okay, we know the past four years of people that invested in pre-construction isn't looking very good, and it might take some time to get back for them to even just get their money back, right? Let yeah. alone losing the money every month on cash flow. 
Okay, so everyone's talking about now, well, just hang tight because developers aren't building anything right now and there will be mm -hmm. lots of new launches this year, next year, and maybe the year after. But 2028 has been deemed by many, many people the year where condo market bounces back. It doesn't just bounce back, but it's going to go crazy because there's no new inventory. Lots of new immigrants are getting to the point that they're going to be interested in buying housing. Interest rates by 2028, you know, if we don't have something crazy happen that we don't see coming, could be three to three and a half percent. Like that, that's a totally realistic projection. Are you on board with this 2028? Just hang tight till then things will be good. I think in the investor circle, it's um, survive till 2029. That's okay. what everyone's texting each other in the low group chats that we have. <laughs> <laughs> and like, keep in mind, like I'm talking to guys who are like with like duplexes and houses, right? Not right. like, not like pre-con side. I agree that the condo market will see a bounce back, but like, are we going to see 10% back to back growth? Like we saw in 2015 to 2019. I don't know. Like, cause Probably not. let's just say, yeah, let's just say there's no product that comes out from the pre-con side. Like on a good year, we build what? Like, 40,000 units half of them go to the rental side some people don't move like you still got existing inventory that's going to sell trade people who move up people are trying to get into the market so it's not like there's going to be like a complete draught of units it's just that the units that aren't new brand new aren't coming on market and you and I both know that you know these finished new build condos they don't get sold once they're closed because of the HST for the 24 grand right mm -hmm. so it's not like that stuff comes on the market anyways where I see where we have some problems actually the rental market and then when the rental market gets tight it may move into the resale market and then with the existing inventory that doesn't come on it may sh move it up but like 10 percent year over year growth it's hard when your starting price is what 600 700 it made yeah. so much more sense at 300 because like looking back now like when I was getting mortgages in like 2013 and I'm like zero down you're going to pay for my closing? Yeah, I should have done like way more of these. But now I'm like 20% down. It's double the price. Like how much more room do you have? Because you now remove the certain like income of, sorry, remove a certain segment of buyers without the income to buy, right? It just and becomes more exclusive. 2028 or 29 maybe now is this, you know, survive. You make it, make it to then and you'll be okay. Um, I'm, I'm thinking like, so if, you, if you're having that conversation right now and you're like, just get to that point in time, when do you think they bought that condo? 2020? 2019? Like pre-construction, how long will it have been? That's a 10-year time frame to make it worth what you paid for it. Yeah, 100%. That's probably the longest we've ever had in the Toronto market going back to 89 to 2002 where we caught back up to 89. Other than yeah. that, that would be the longest horizon we've ever seen where something didn't get its value back. Yeah, I love that you know the numbers too, because I know exactly what you're talking about. I looked at that chart too. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's going to be wild. And the conversations I have, some people are asking me, I'm like, what do you do for work? Right. I'm like, can you know us as business owners, can you take that capital, take an L on it, get some of it back? Can you put it into your business yeah. so it have a higher ROI? Right. But like, you know, if your T4, your potential income earning isn't, you know, infinite or whatever, then really you are just going to be riding it out because you want to take a big L. So if it really just depends on who the person is. Steve's tenant may or may not have given notice on an investment property that he owns. I can't get a clear answer out of him, but he's decided not to sell and to keep it and think long term. You know, if now he didn't pay pre-con prices, he's made oh, money okay. on his con. It's a whole different conversation, right? If you were in that scenario, whether you've made money on it or not made money on it, and it's you now had an opportunity where a tenant gave notice and it's vacant, would you think, you know what, I know the even the resale market's not great, but I just want to wrap this up and move on with my life? Or would you personally hang tight till 29? Steve, can I analyze your situation? I'm going to ask you some slightly more personal questions. Okay. <laughs> Is this intended for your kids at some point? Likely. Okay, then why are you ever going to sell it? Just hang on to it. You're going to have a capital gain. Simple. Headache. Headache is the big deal. <sighs> property manager, if you bought a while ago, 6 to 8%, property manager, put it in and you don't have to deal with it. Is that all it is? 6 to 8%? I thought it was like 15%, 20%.
Um, some of them are remote no. places are 10. I know in so Toronto, you can get flat like 6 8%, okay. sometimes even like 200 bucks a month. Here's the problem with property managers from my point of view and why I don't use them. One, I have, I mean, it's not far from my house, so it's easy for me to maintain. Uh, two is obviously cost, but really they don't super care about who they put in. I care mm. about who I put in my property. I care that they're going to treat the place right and they're going to be like, they have like a checklist, like dog, yes, no, <clears throat> amount of occupants, yes, no, credit score, yes, no, whatever that desired is, maybe by the, the landlord. But then it's like, okay. And uh, I think that's where issues can come, creep in for me. I want to have a bit of a connection to the person. And I want to, uh, like, when I rent out a property, I'll say, listen. I'm going to be the best landlord you ever had. You better be a good tenant, right? Like that's how this is going to go. If something's broken, I will hundred percent fix it. I need to be notified of it. If I come in and the place is thrashed, our relationship is going to train change quickly. Right. And we have those conversations way up front and I just, that you're not going to get that out of a property manager. No, um, definitely not. Yeah. So you're going to get much more of a, you know, check. I would assume that if I'm going to use a property manager, I probably also have to budget for a renovation after the, <laughs> at, at the time. You're so cynical. Oh, Could you bad. not it's pay not a property bad. manager just to manage <clears throat> the th in between the tenants? Like you could still, you That's could find the tenant. You're right. And then you just pay them in between to deal with yeah. all the other stuff. And that would yeah, be like, cheaper, just, I'm guessing, right? It is. So what we do is we fill it ourselves because I'm similar to Steve. I like to interview them, cross check everything, geo warehouse, their previous landlords, single key the crap out of it, dig into their socials. Like I need to know like everything about you. I want to look at your bank statements. You say you don't have pets. Why were you at, you know, the pet store the last three <laughs> times, right? No, I'm serious. This is, this, is, this is real. And then once like I'm okay, comfortable though, then I'll have someone manage it, right? Because we have more houses than we have condos and just like hot water tank leaking, um, you know, roof leaks. Houses are, I just don't want those. Houses are tough. Houses are yeah. like the roof, the grass, the everything, right? It's, That's it's, why it's really I, annoying. yeah, I stick with strata units because the roof ain't my problem. The boiler not working ain't my problem, all that stuff. So I get yeah, we, we don't have management for the condos because they're pretty easy. And like most of our condos are downtown. So like the tenant profile, like we never hear from them. If anything, I'm always like, hey, I'm going to come do a walkthrough. I just want to make sure everything's OK, because like I just want to make sure like nothing's burnt down or something. I got to tell you, I had the best experience last week. We um, one of my clients was given notice by their tenant and they decided like, OK, it's time to sell. So I reach out to the tenant and we all know how this this next part usually goes is like, OK, fine, um, but I don't want showings ever and, uh, <laughs> you know, make it really easy on me. And I know what the rules are, but here's how I want to do things. And I had just the best conversation. I'm like, hey, because they gave notice, right? I'm like, would you mind? It's going to be so much easier for us to sell because I, I still have to put tenant in on on occupancy when I list this property because you're there till a certain period of time. Are you okay to sign the N11 because you gave us notice? We're like, yep. Ten minutes later, N11 sign. And then I'm oh, like, wow. could we take new photos? Because when we ri originally leased it to you, it was vacant. She's like, yeah, no worries. Come in, take them. Zen, it looks staged. It was like the the best experience I've ever had with a property where I go in and the tenant's like, yeah, whatever, just take photos. My stuff's there. It looks like it was professionally staged. And we. Oh, that's and that, no, ne that never ever happens and we've we've only had it on the market for three days and i've had five showings in three nice. days in this condo market just That's just to fun. give people some hope out there that like you can still sell a tenanted property uh and it could be an okay experience it's not easy well, we, but it could happen yeah. we had something similar the tenant was amazing great taste in furniture i walked mm -hmm. in i'm like Holy smokes. You know, like you got the staging and like kind of looks like, you know, monotone or there's yep. like certain style, but you know what's staged. But then when you walk into like someone's house and they got like artwork that's cohesive with the furniture. So we're in this like two story King uh, West loft and I walked in, I'm like, oh my God, it looks like a celebrity lives here. It's got this kind of like rugged loft style look, like appropriate furniture, artwork is everywhere. I'm like, 
can we take photos of this before you do anything else? He's right. like, oh, yeah, no problem. My cleaner just came through today. I'm like, you are the best. <laughs> It sounds very downtowny. This doesn't sound like Surrey, BC. <laughs> what, what's a Surrey, BC typical tenanted condo situation? Condo? Oh, yeah. Uh, Is there condos? You got condos over there, Steve? We definitely got condos, but I'm just trying to think. There's a difference definitely between townhouse and detached house tenants and, and condo tenants. The what's condo the difference? Tenants, condo tenants these days are very often... Uh, box spring or mattress on the floor. Um, you know, sure, there's a small kitchen table and there's no art on the wall and maybe they clean okay. Um, they they work from home. Like, it's a, it's a very kind of typical... Nothing's put away. Like, there's, you know, if they own a vacuum, it's in the corner. It's not tucked in the, in the closet or anything, right? So it's not necessarily terrible it's just never going to show well they're not going to clean they're not going to take their hair out of the shower before showing that's what you're going to get that's all you're going to get um then you go when you move up to like the detached homes generally you'll get families and that's where the disaster happens always that's, well it's hard with you, kids yeah it's so hard yeah. my house looks like a bomb went off clean my house yeah. Time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah i don't know i it's yeah, there's then there's always pets around and big families and stuff. And it, it really starts to usually go like very rarely do I have a if I sell a tenanted property, is the tenant willing to clean uh, like will, at all? Yeah. Will you there's, ask them like can in the we sink. send in a cleaner for you? Yeah, but what's that going to oh. do for one day? Piece of piece of advice, actually, is that I, I like your input on this. I had one client that always swore by no matter what, when they would re-rent out their property, they would it would be fifty dollars more than any other comparable, but they would guarantee and it cost more than this obviously, but they would guarantee that once a month a cleaner went in to uh to clean. And the tenant loved it because it's like it's in my rent, it's taken care of. And so they knew every month it was being cleaned and the cleaner cleaned several of their properties. So they literally give them updates on like, yep, it looks good in there. You got nothing to worry about. Like yeah, as a I landlord, that's that interesting, time. right? Have you it seen what cleaners charge point. now? I, I should be a cleaner. I shouldn't be a realtor anymore. Cleaners uh, are charging bank. Uh, we, we did a townhouse recently that needed like a full gut clean. It was $600. I couldn't, I could not could not believe it Damn, that 50 bucks is yeah maybe it's different these days but per hour 50 bucks per hour for a cleaner right now we sent our cleaners for one bedroom and it was 250 they've gone up to three now and we did a big house 2500 square feet four bedrooms four washrooms like 800 dollars. and i was like what oh yeah yeah. Uh, I mean, they do the companies. We've got two companies we use that I think do a really, really great job, but I cannot believe the prices. Yeah, it's pretty astronomical, like what it is. Got, I mean, there's nothing you can do about it at this point. Like everything's gone up. Like I was looking at taking my little guy to CNE, and I still remember like $5 after five. And my wife's telling me, she's like, it's $26 plus $3 service fee plus tax. I'm like, you're telling me it's 30 bucks again to CNE before I pay $20 for a fried hot dog? Mm -hmm. uh, you mm -hmm. got to go to a Jays game on uh, Looney Dog Day. <laughs> Just get as many as you. But okay, that this is an interesting way to take the conversation. There used to be Toonie Tuesdays, two bucks to get a Jays ticket and sit in the 500s. So let's, let's take this over to housing because we've yeah. talked about this, me and Steve have talked about this, and we see this in our comments all the time. When I bought my house, it was only three to five times income, and now it's 10 to 12. Well, it should go back to what it used to be. Why? That's not fair. I'm not buying again until it goes back to this. What would the general response be to that? Sorry. Good luck. I wish you the best <laughs> of luck. Um, I can't help you. Let right? Like, it's just you... unfortunate. Yeah. Let me know when you invent a time machine. Yeah, that's I guess. another good one. Or increase yeah. your income, <laughs> but but uh, that's pretty much that's what's going to happen, happen though. What's going to happen yeah. is we're going to just get increased incomes until like house prices uh, acceleration obviously slows. You go through a period where wages start to catch up, right? Yep. And that's what we're seeing now. Um, wages. I know people are like, oh, the average person is that okay? Average. Throw that out the door. What's the average homeowner making? It's a lot more. 
than yep. than before. It's actually my theory on why immigration is what it is because they do need uh, cheap labor to come into the country, right? So that's why they're doing it. Um, that's the reality is you will at some point have wages increase so quickly uh, that it will make sense again at some point. But at the same time, not because we're becoming an older um, society, I guess. And it, it seems to me like every older society eventually gets to a class of, of landlords versus tenants. 100%. Probably, like when I was probably in all Europe, true. Yeah, when I was in Europe, like... I don't know about you guys when i travel like they always have those real estate offices and they always have signs of listings posted yeah. and i look at it i convert a canadian gpt i'm like what's the average income right and i'm like same problem as us exact same mm -hmm. problem right in some way shape or form and the only way that i think a lot of people are going to own is you have to increase your income so this like wait for the proverbial crash in hopes that you can buy i'm like one you're probably not going to buy in a bad market and two i just don't think it's going to happen because prices aren't going to come down to the replacement costs and i've been explaining this again to a lot of people like if you can't build a condo for a thousand bucks a foot and you can buy it for 950 that's like a slam dunk right we we're doing this in little small towns like years ago where like you know we we're buying homes for 200 300 and like it cost like 400 to build that home so it's not going to happen. And if you have wage increase, the only way to make income, but you're bringing in like a million people a year for cheap labor, at some point that math doesn't work, right? So you either have to be in a very specialized, like high paying form of job to buy these kind of assets, even if it stagnates for the next 10 years, or you just kind of give up and move somewhere else, which is what we're seeing right now. Mm -hmm. Zen, I want to give you a date. And I want you to explain, because many viewers are going to know exactly what I'm talking about, but some may not know this if they're new to real estate investing or they're just renting a property. So November 15th, 2018, for, I know a good chunk of our audience probably knows what I'm talking about, but for those that don't, why is that date so important? And let's talk about in, I'm an investor in real estate on one side of the coin to I'm just looking to rent a place. Well, that's when rent control was re-implemented from the 1992 rules. So anything that was completed, so the keyword is completed, which is occupied after that date is not subject to the rent control rules. And the guideline in Ontario in the last two years has been two and a half percent increase. So if you are a tenant and you're looking for a place and you want long-term stability, you do not want to look to rent in a place that's fancy and shiny. You want that old dated one because the landlord will not be able to increase the rent on you more than whatever the guideline is. So two and a half percent. But if you are a tenant and you get into these new places, they can increase the rent on you as much as they want. And that's a form of, you know, getting you out of the property as well. As an investor, I would generally say it's probably worth a 10, 15 percent kind of like increase to pay for that. Mm -hmm. But right now, I would say, I feel like politically we're going to get some more rent control rules coming down the pipeline, but yeah. <laughs> like if I, let's give, so this is an example. Let's say you bought a investment condo in 2014, okay? So it's probably doubled in price up to 2020 and then done nothing since then. Well, not done nothing, but gone up and down a few times uh, since then. And it's a building that is not under rent control and your tenant gives notice. So like, okay, it's gonna be vacant. I have an opportunity. I could sell it. I could just get all this money out, of course, capital gains and all that fun stuff. Or I could sell this and I could then reinvest because the numbers haven't moved in five years and get into a building after that date. Obviously there's transaction costs, land transfer, real estate. If you say 10 to 15% premium to get in one of those buildings, is there an opportunity in today's market to consider that or should you be like, no, just don't do not do that? If you're a real estate agent in Ontario, you're well aware of what Tressa is in the new RICO information guide and explaining that guide to your clients is of absolute importance and is mandatory. Now, we've been using an additional resource that we got from TressaVideo.ca. It's been really helping our team have that conversation with potential buyers and potential sellers from the very beginning. Check out TressaVideo.ca to learn more. I've been asked that a lot of times. My wife hates me for this sometimes because I say don't do it because like we just lose business. But <laughs> if you do the math, the transaction cost is just way too high. It makes Agreed. no sense. Mm -hmm. And if you're like in 2014 and you've been owning properties, I've been like really getting introspective and psychological with a lot of my investors. I'm like, look, you have a ton of money. 
why don't you just rent it to someone a little bit under market get the best tenant and just like sit and wait for it until you need the money because like unless you absolutely need the money why are you paying transaction costs why are you paying me transaction costs mm -hmm. why are you paying capital gains right just sit on it and do what you were planning to do like sell it when you retire you know transfer it to your kids set up in like a trust or something and that's what it was so like even for me right now like i rather be a hundred bucks under market for my properties and have a good tenant that'll take care of it yeah. and not have to deal with it just because like i don't want that hassle in my life and this you know coming from talking to you two who are dads like i think my perspective has changed since i've become a father for sure like i just you, don't have enough time for all this stuff you're, you're more grouchy than St like steve mm, i'm like maybe 50 percent steve grouchy <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a lot, lot. <laughs> that's a lot of grouchy all right off camera <laughs> final final thing i'm gonna key on on this topic is like okay uh contrary to popular belief zen there are still some new investors that are entering the toronto condo market in 2024 they do exist you know they're a rare breed but they exist okay to them like these are conversations i'm having i'd like to see what you're saying as well like if you can you would be buying in a building after that date though right if you're starting this yep. process now it's like well I can already like think of my, there's one near my office, like uh 27 Bathurst and 576 front that Minto one on the corner there. I'm like, building. Th that's not under rent control. I've had a few listings there that sell pretty quickly, even in down markets. Like if you're looking in that core, that's what I would key in on. Is that fair to say same conversations? Yeah. 100%. If you're very adamant that you want condo, so it's easier management, yeah. then I would pay that little premium for it. Cause I think it's worthwhile because you can never go back from it unless like, for some reason you're you know in a really really good building thousand bucks a foot that rents at four dollars a foot right so then yeah i would do that so this would have been like i don't know like two years ago the charlie building was good before maintenance fee went up uh -huh. but they're um, under rent control yeah so like it just really depends on what you're after right because if you also plan to have so many tenants cycle through then you're going to hold this for a long term, then it's worth it. But if you're going to like, hey, I want to exit in five years, then like, it doesn't really matter. If you're buying resale right now, uh, would you be buying a junior one bedroom, a one bedroom, a two bedroom or a three bedroom as a condo investment in Toronto? Smallest one bedroom that has a squared layout and no mm -hmm. sliding door. And the mm -hmm. bedroom needs to be at least 10 by 10 because then you have liquidity on selling to a first time home buyer. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can't believe, well, it's not that I shouldn't say that I can't believe it, but I've seen this in my experience of listing a bunch of these type of properties this year is that the junior one beds in downward trending markets where investors don't exist uh, are almost as hard to sell as tenanted properties. If you have a junior <laughs> one bed that's tenanted, well, good luck. <laughs> good luck. Because it's... Yeah. Uh, Unless they, they just moved in, they're paying great rent and some investors are going to come in and, and assume them. Uh, it's just very difficult. But I'm, I always think about that, right? Because the numbers have always worked better on smaller Small. unit. You know, you just talked about $4 per square foot. Some of these, uh, you've seen the, the new buildings at the well. Some of those are renting for five bucks a square foot. It's you wild, the, the well, rent, yeah. The rental price. I mean, like they did a great job. I made a full video telling people, hey, this is great. Here's 10 other buildings you should buy in instead <laughs> because <laughs> it's nice. But like the prices are just. Um, did steep. you get a legal letter from Tridel? <laughs> no, I because I no no Tridel has not reached out to me. And uh, if they did, I'd say, I think you're doing a great job and keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, next time you come, I'm going to take you to the well. I think you you think it's, it's very nice. Cool. It, it's yeah. pretty cool. Well, Sorry, go Let me ask you this, Tom. So, like, okay, not not to take BC out of this, Steve. Sorry, but what do you think are going to happen to all these like junior one beds? Because let's say rates go back to three, I still don't think all the investors will be back. And if investors are like fifty percent of the buying pool, and the first time buyers aren't buying these things, like, so what's going to happen to them? Well, I think the okay. So if the investors aren't there, then it's like, well, who else is going to buy it? And you just said it, it's the first time home buyers. And first time home buyers say they want affordable real estate, but they've made it clear with their actions that they don't believe the prices on these junior one beds is something that they're interested in, right? Nope. And per perhaps that's because the price gap between that to what you just explained, a good one bedroom with a real bedroom, I know that sounds crazy to say, but that's the reality of the Toronto condo market, is only 50 grand more. Well, I'm gonna go buy that one instead. And maybe if that plays out over a period of time, those ones keep moving, these ones don't, that the stuff that is sub 500 square feet, 
zero bedrooms just gets pushed so far down in price that finally it gets to a point that they go, okay, it's the gap between that and a real one bedroom is big enough that I will, I'll buy the smaller one now because it makes sense. Because I think right now they're saying it doesn't make sense. So that would be my but, guess. But here's the challenge. A lot of these 450, 480 junior one bedrooms were pre-con 2018, 2019. Yep. They would have paid a premium on that. So for them to be less than these other ones we're talking about, a lot of these investors could be taking a loss. I think that's the reality though, is it not? Like in my mind, I was thinking of a building in King West that was like 2014 when I was giving that example. Um, so whatever, you still made money on it. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think these investors are just going to have to either continuously rent it because they still tend to rent okay. They'll still rent. Yeah. Um, but finding someone that's willing to buy them is difficult. So, I mean, if the interest isn't there, then prices just have to go down. Do they not? I think so. And I think that's spread between like, you know, what someone can buy may get a little bit better if the in incomes increase. And maybe that's when the market will pick up, right? Steve even admitted on an episode a few months ago that if he were to buy a small one bedroom in downtown Toronto, he would actually rent instead because it's so much cheaper to rent that same property. Steve, I said if my, my option was to buy a junior one bed or <laughs> to rent a junior one bed, I would per I would pick to rent because I would not want necessarily that product. But what would you do with that down payment? Invest it in the stock market? At Steve's exactly a, the right. I would have big... invested it in NVIDIA two years ago. <laughs> I would have invested in Apple in 1995 yeah, yeah. Right, right, <laughs> when right. I was eight. <laughs> Let me throw a, a wrench in your in your plan here. 50% um, of our buyers right now, which is, by the way, more than just two buyers, um, are <laughs> investors. Uh, we okay, so have... I will add something on that afterwards but okay we have investors that are looking at stuff acting on things saying this makes sense saying uh long term uh, taking advantage of the fact that they have some things to pick from uh we have investors that have recently purchased in detached we have investors that have recently purchased in condos uh we have more that are looking at uh multi-unit detached let's call it um th they're there the, the investors are there and they're not investors that are walking into a sales center, putting down 60K and crossing their fingers and walking away. They are people that are saying, listen, this is my plan to ask, hold an asset for a certain period of time. Um, I think that there's a little too many folks that are maybe they're they have some crazy ideas and we got to settle them down. Let's say we got to be like, no, 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 that's not what's going to happen. It's going to be this way. Um, but they're here. They're, they're not throwing money around like crazy. They're making good decisions based on where they think the future is going to be and based on what they can carry properties for and how they can finance them. So do you guys want to, I'll reveal a little secret on your show for you guys. Oh, we have a lot of investors back. <gasps> I wasn't going to talk about it, but I, we have a lot of investors asking what's going on. We have a lot of investors throwing low balls, like 80, 85 cents on the dollar on, on assignments or on nope. resale. Um, on resale. Okay. Resale doesn't work as much assignments. I think we're a little bit over unless they bought it in 2018, 2019. Okay. But there's a lot of duplexes that we also have as well in the surrounding areas where a lot of people bought them for really high prices and they're low key on the private side, letting go of them. So if you buy it right now, you know, these are like 750, 800 purchases, upstairs, downstairs, legal units, you're getting 48, $4,900 in rent. And they're still like cash flow pods of 200 bucks right now. And they're moving. We got how, investors for them. How far outside Toronto do you have to drive to find that? Hamilton. Okay. Barry, you can do it in like Whitby, Oshawa right now. And are they buying those at that price for cash flow? Or do they also believe that those markets in the next 10 years will do something with prices going upwards? So my philosophy has always been try to own land because you can always add value to land. Sure. All right. We have our condos from pre gone but that's fine. Um, but Hamilton and Barry have been very friendly with garden suites. If you could plop something down there for like, 400 you rent it for 2500 which is like 
you know, 48,000 divided by your cost, you're like over 10% cap. So people who are looking at this thing where you're buying these lots where you can like plop another third unit in, those cash flow units are going to look great when the rates are at 3%. Those garden suites, um, I've never done this myself personally. I see them popping up uh, in my neighborhood. Um, can you get financing on building that for 400 or do you need cash? Most of these guys are heavy cash and we'll be okay. refinancing from or like refinance from okay. other properties. Yeah. That's what I thought. So I get that's the only kind of caveat to that is you got to have you got to have those funds to then get that 10 percent. Right. Yeah. Like, don't get me wrong. Like these investors that I'm talking about that we're looking again, they're not like buying their first investment property. Like we've managed mm-hmm. their portfolio for a long time and they're coming to like, hey, I think I smell some blood in the water. I think it's time to make a move because mm-hmm. we, we, we all know like we talk about articles online and headlines and everything. And that stuff is always like 30, 60 days late. Yep. Right. So we see the stuff that's on the ground and, you know, like I, I sometimes just don't say it on my video because like, I'm like, it's going to get in the way of my clients transacting. I'm not going to say that. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, it, it, it's an interesting time when you look at investors coming back and I'm like, I'm thinking condos right now, but then you have a different uh people don't think about it necessarily correctly so let me let me give you an example let's say there's a condo right now in downtown surrey and it's a one bed and it used to be 500 now it's 450. Uh, maybe there's some desperate people and you can go in on the 451 you can pick it up for 430 420 and like you're a lot cheaper you're 20 percent cheaper than you were maybe at the beginning of the year but that's not good enough. What we want to do is we want to go in and offer three fifty on the three ninety nine listing that's going to sell for four twenty. <laughs> right? Like you have to also educate yourself on the realities of the marketplace. It's not like you're, and you know what? If everybody's still listed at four fifty, you got to do some work. Maybe you got to off, offer a bunch of four four ten offers to try and get negotiations going with, to find out who's really going to move. But if you're going to go in on the 399 listing and that guy's expecting 460 anyway, you know, you're wasting everybody's time. It's just not the realities of it. So that's what gets in so many people's heads. They go, okay, well, yeah, they finally came down. Look, this one's listed at 399. Now I can finally pick it up for 300. And you're like, okay, you're wasting, yeah, but- you're wasting your time. You're not real life. Let's get into real life and, and see where these numbers make sense. Is that in Steve's market, it seems to be more of a trend than our market where people will just list a property at a price and not set an offer date and expect way more. I know that happens a little bit for us, but it seems to be like normal for them, they, which is uh, mind they set boggling. An offer, they set an offer date, but usually they'll surpass the offer date. And just then, don't. Okay, um, that happens here. Sometimes yeah, yeah, yeah. They that happens spend, all the time. That happens they the don't time. update. Um, the price, right? They don't yeah. go, okay, you know what? Didn't work. We're going to list it at 449 no, no, now. No, 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 no. I think it's deliberate because there's brokerage remarks where mm-hmm. if you're anticipating more than the price, like the marketing price, it will say, hey, we're reviewing offers at X date. But we can see the history of like the listing being edited. So when clients send me like, hey, what about this? I'm like, well, these guys have removed their offer date, mm-hmm. but they kept the price the same. So clearly it's deliberate because if you're changing your listing, you could just change it to what you want. And I always wonder, I'm like, what's the mindset behind that? And the only thing I could honestly think of, and I'd love to hear both your opinions on this is, hey, I'm a terrible listing agent, but I want to show my clients that I have showings. It's maybe that um, there, there also could be some price discovery where like, let's let's say I think my property's worth, I don't know, 1.1 million. And I decide to take the 999 listing approach and then the seven to 10 days goes and I don't get it. And we remove the the date from the brokerage remarks, but I've kept the price the same. So you don't know, some sellers may actually be willing to take that price now. And some might still want a million fifty. So I think that's, that's where it's tough. Like even if they remove the date, it doesn't necessarily mean one or the other. You kind of got to call the listing agent and like, you know, suss it out as the kids say, yep. right? Yeah, you like, gotta, like a lot of the agents now are just coming flat out like hey 399 i see you've been on the market for 60 days and they'll just be like seller's expectations are 450 or higher and i'm like i just want to reach through the phone and strangle them and tell them to list their property back at 459 um so they can save time for everybody because this it's is just where a- i agree with Crouchy steve like just 
can you just make our lives easier? Like, yeah. let's stop being assholes about this. Like, it pisses off the consumer. It pisses off other agents, too. Yeah. The problem is, I, though, is it worked really well for a long time. It does. That's the problem. It does. In the first yeah. week. In the first week, it did work very well for a long time. Well, I have a solution, though, Zen. I have a solution. I can fix this today. I can fix this absolutely today. I'm all anything, yours. anything over the asking price, the agents get paid zero for. I don't think that solves the problem. Because Why like not? if you're, well, I mean, if you're underlisting something by call it 10%, you lose 10% on that spread. You still get a transaction out of it and it moves faster. I don't think it solves the problem. If it, sell, yeah, if it sells for lower, you should get more of the commission then? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. What I'm saying, if, he, if it sells for... <laughs> I get what listen, you're saying. There, there is an argument that buyer's agent's commission should be done that way if buyers would pay directly. Um what I'm what I'm saying though is that is something where you can say, listen, if you're that bad at marketing your property at a correct price, because I don't think we should be under listing properties. I just I just never think it's a right thing. Now, here's here's where underlisting came in when we discussed this before. So underlisting was like, listen, guys, this is worth five to five ten. Let's put it at four ninety nine. Get this thing gone in a week, and we get an offer. And then the problem is one came in at five twenty, and we were like, <gasps> and then the next guy goes. Instead of, you know what, 519 or 509 or 499, they're like, how about 399? <laughs> and then, it, you know, like this is how stupid it got. So I don't think that we should be misleading uh, consumers because an asking price has traditionally been an asking price. And even in the event that the price does go up, it should be a whoops. It shouldn't be uh, expected that the price goes up. But, but Zen, are you not surprised even in today's market, how many people are still doing offer dates on condos when there's seven and a half months of inventory in downtown Toronto? Oh, people are still it trying it. Blows my mind. There's like, I think two listing appointments I went on and well, I say all the time, I'm like, guys, don't like hold your offers. And then um, I don't know about you guys, but I'm always asked, like, are you guys interviewing any other agents, right? And then usually they tell me and there was two listing appointments I lost out on and I saw the offer, sorry, the listing come up. I'm like, why are you holding offers on this thing? And like you, so, I mean, you and I both know, like we can fake a showing, see if sure. they get any offers and nothing goes. And it really just blows my mind because it's and just not to be that, clear, just, just for the audience, when you say fake a show, oh, you mean like you got a real showing, but it's cause you listed yeah, yeah. low. Okay. All right. Yeah. 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 No, 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 no. Sorry. I meant like I would go book a showing and cancel it, but then I would get the broker. Oh, I see. On. Okay. So yeah, they, yeah. 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 We're getting really deep in the weeds now. Yeah. yeah. For tenant landlord or homeowner insurance policies, go to squareone.ca slash the Tom story show. Use the link in the description. Save $20 when you start your free quote right now. So at that point, like, I don't think it's that the consumers who are selling, that's not their problem. It's that certain agents that haven't been around enough or they don't understand mm -hmm. it, it becomes a tactic in the listing agreement or sorry, listing presentation. And they say, hey, this is going to work because you have a great property and every seller thinks they have a great property. And that is kind of like, hey, I'd rather get your listing and then mm. I'll work you down so I eventually sell it. Yep. And that's what I kind of, at least then I think has happened. Then I think we might have yeah. both lost on the same recent listings. <laughs> 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 I had a few like that where they went with someone else and then they did an offer date and now they're still sitting on the market at the new price. So. <clears throat> but you're that short lived means. in the market if you do tactics that one, don't work for your client and then also piss off everybody else that is your colleagues. Like what you're, you short, you're not going to be around long term. I just always, I always go back to the mindset of, I was dealing with a developer once on a massive deal. And we broke out, we were starting to talk about fees and, you know, buyer fees and whatever. And he's like, okay, so what are they offering? Cause it's on exclusive and all these different things. And, uh, you know, we, we started talking about fees and I actually had the discussion with him. He's like, listen, my buyer's agents have to get paid and they have to get paid well. And I was like, oh, I do. Well, well I mean, it's a big deal. What do you care if it's three quarters of a percent versus one percent? Like this is many millions of dollars. And he's like, listen, if my buyer's agents don't get paid well, they're probably not bringing me the next opportunity that they have to my desk. Oh, interesting. Right. So like there's that guy has 
in as from a builder's point of view, he has a reputation that he wants to be a good builder to work with. So you can have an income as an agent. So he wants the opportunities to come to him. So for instance, if you're not making in the development world, it'll be like a 1%, right? If you're not making a 1%, he's like, okay, I'm going to top you up to 1% through this transaction somehow. Because his livelihood comes from opportunities being brought to him. And this is all off market, like commercial stuff, right? Like it's, it's a different world. So your reputation in any business, that just happened to be an example of a, a developer, right? Your reputation will get positive or negative but right? that's it only just if you last long enough in the business right because like Correct. i think all of us are 10 years in the business and like sometimes you run into the same agent like okay we've done a deal together yeah. it's easier but there's so many new ones out there i don't think they care and they're just trying to scrape for that like two to three transactions a year mm -hmm. oh, and that's just absolutely what's happening yeah what's your um how many times do you think a property can be relisted at different prices before it's burned like, do you think it's three price, not price changes where it's the same listing, but like three new listings? How many until the public starts going like, well, what the hell is wrong with this? I'd say four. Yeah, I think I was gonna say five is 100% burned. And then yeah, yeah, 100 th three, you better get sold on the third try. Because after that, it's like, you might as well just wait a year. Just get, <laughs> let the market change. No, no, the, the sweet spot is you want to be that second agent to do the price reduction on yeah. that new listing. Once you're on the third one, you're like, okay, it's definitely not us. It's definitely the seller. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Isn't, isn't it funny when you go through those and you see those properties that are like, cancel relist, cancel relist, can or termination and relist with a different agent or, it just makes me just wonder. Like well, if it's, it's also, the same agent to me, it's like, okay, everybody's happy. They're just not getting their price. So something's yeah. up there. If it's a different agent every single time, and there's seven agents down the line. I'm like, oh, I'm not calling that person back for that appointment at all. <laughs> if the previous seven guys didn't make them happy, is there any chance I'm going to make you happy? <laughs> Probably not. Yeah, I actually was in a listing presentation once, and I think I was like agent four or five on this thing. And I went, I'm like, I'm like, I'm, I'm just going because whatever, right? Let's see where it goes. And the seller was like, hey. Um, you know, you got a YouTube channel, you look like you're big. What's your secret sauce? Can you sell my property? I'm like, yeah, I can. She's like, how fast can you sell? I'm like, if you drop your price to this, you'll sell it. She's like, oh no, I won't do it. I'm like, can mm -hmm. you drop your commission? I'm like, sure, I can, but are you gonna drop your price? She's like, no. I'm like, okay, sorry, I can't help you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, last year I had a lady, um, I had a lady, we listed her property. There was just no making her happy, right? She wanted 919 for her place. And I said, listen, like this thing has to be 840. It will not sell above 840. It's just not going to do it. And she was just against me. We finally got her down to 899. And she was like, no, nope, not 840. I'm like, listen, we, we actually went over there. Uh, she was so hard to deal with that we went over there with uh, the, the old, here's your price reduction, here's your cancellation. Right? <laughs> Which one do you pick? Mm -hmm. So she picked, no, I'm not working with you guys anymore. Three days later, my photos pop up on the listing with another agent. <laughs> right? 839. Sold in 14 days. What happened? It was all price. Of course it was it's price. Always price. It's always price. Like 90, 90% of it is price. It was so what do you price. do in those instances though? Like I've seen my photos come up. And like I think in Trev now we have those like watermarks. Yeah, you can't really but do like, it. Yeah. No, people still do it. They, they, just it. It they just double it. They just double it. They just <laughs> or they crop it before they. Yeah, that's the, that's a new thing. Yeah. I'm like, you use paint to crop it. It's not even the right aspect ratio. You know, I I, uh, like, I don't. I, I get them dealt with. I get them dealt. I with. used to have a photographer that, um, like, I had permission to use the photos, and the seller uh, had the right to use them. But he actually messaged me once saying someone reused your photos on the same listing, uh, and they're my photos, so they're not allowed. to Like the photographer said this to me. I'm like, oh, well, then take it up with them. Like, I'm moving on with my life. I don't care about that property anymore. Like, that was when we actually sold and they relisted it, like, not too far after the closing date. Yeah. But, uh, okay, Zen, here's where I want to wrap this up because I know us three could ramble on for hours if we didn't have timelines oh, here. Right. Yes. Um, your investment philosophy, I think, is interesting. I know the way that you built out your business was potentially new construction based to start. 
and I know you still own investment condos, but a lot of that you talked about today is is that now you've kind of transitioned into buying freehold properties or helping clients with duplexes and things like that. Is that just the how things have gone over time or was the goal always buy condos because they're cheaper to get me to freehold? Was it always dirt that was the end goal here and it just took you time to get there? No, it actually just came for what I think the opportunity was. So the running joke that my wife and I always had was like, if I knew any better right now, I would have taken all my OSAP money and just plowed into pre-cons when we were in school. But when I got into the industry, like when I started selling stuff for investors, like 2014, 2015, condos made so much sense because they were comparable to resale. They were only taking four years to build. And like the rents made a lot of sense. And not a lot of people at that time wanted to go buy like a house in like Hamilton. They were like, what the hell is Hamilton? Right. And then when condo prices started exploding and pre con stopped making sense, I think around 2017, 2018, like some people got off the bandwagon like Zen, what else is there? I'm like, well, I've been buying these duplexes or what I've been telling people from 2016 to 2019 or so i'm like hey you can buy these resale properties that you could short-term rental and you could do like 10 16 10 to 16 percent cap rate on those things right so it's just like as the market changes what opportunities are there versus what level of management you want and in the beginning everyone wants easy money so like pre-construction made the most sense because you signed a contract it was easy roi was a little bit less right but you know the, the return on pain in the ass was a lot less too but as the opportunities for you know good roi with easy you know return on pain in the ass disappeared people started doing more and more difficult things which required capital and required kind of like managing two tenants and they were still okay with that but now we're getting to the point right now where like as investors are coming back you really just need a lot of capital and now you have to add additional units with like building garden suites or you legalize yourself in these kind of areas and that's why like condos have become more difficult for a lot of my investors um, just because they're like, well, look, these numbers don't make any sense anymore. Even if you want to buy right now, I tell them like, you better hold this thing for 10 years and yeah. your ROI is not going to be great. And have you sold any of the condos you own to move that money into freehold, into these duplexes? Or have you kept everything and just kept going? I have sold. Or refied maybe? Well, I guess I'll tell people. It's low key. I try not to say anything. I've sold two houses uh, to plow into like a bigger one. Mm-hmm. And I have sold zero of my condos. My if you're condo looking for pub- someone to overpay for your new lot, uh, give Daryl Frankfurt a call, and he'll. Uh, <laughs> he does that. That's what he does for a living. Yeah. Okay, I'll let him know. I all the condos we have are unique ones where like I'm big on terraces, so I will not let go of them. Mm-hmm. And okay. like it's hard to value it, so I would rather keep them, um, just because I don't know when I retire, maybe I want to hang out there or just like turn into something, give it to the kid. I don't know. I just want to keep them, right? That's kind of it. Like they're also easy to manage. And the only reason why we sold two of our houses was just like one, the tenant moved out and like we just didn't want to deal with anymore. Mm -hmm. And then the other one, it just became the tenant was so problematic that we cash for keyed them out and then we sold it. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, okay. Final. Sorry, Steve, go on. Oh, I was just going to say like, it's always wise to buy real estate that you might move into one day as like a worst case scenario. Uh, I always think about that, and um, it's uh, it's at a point here where I'm looking at things over the next little while and go, okay, how many years will I be in my house and that sort of thing. And some of the things we're looking at are like, I might not live in nearly as high a quality a house as I live in now, and I might get something that's cool as can be, and I want to like live in it for that reason. Um, but I I thought of that when I bought my condo, right? Like it 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 has some certain features that you can't get in a condo anywhere else. And, uh, those would be things that I would, that I kind of cherish as well. Right. Yeah. I'm the same. Like the condos we have, the terrace for most of them is larger than the unit. (laughs) I could probably guess what buildings you own in, but I'll do it once we start You you probably can. You probably keep it low key. Don't talk to me. Yeah. Don't talk to me. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, I mean, listen, what you guys both just said is something we talked about a lot that you both own properties that have something that is a wow factor. That's not cookie cutter like everything else. And and that's why you're holding them. And here's where I'll wrap this up. Um, I'm sure there's someone listening to this saying, OK, 
I appreciate that maybe duplexes may make more sense these days than buying a condo investment, but I, I don't even own yet. I just want to buy my first property, but I'm currently renting. Is Zen, is anyone buying these duplexes and actually moving into one and renting out the other one, or are they just purely number game? If the parents go on title, they will. And okay. the smart ones that I have, they um, rent out, they live in the basement and they rent out the top. And that, when I do the math on these, is a lower monthly carry than owning like a condo or even renting. So if you have parent help 20% down on 750, right? And you rent out upstairs for 3000, your carry is like, call it five, okay? Right. Your monthly burn after you collect rent and everything is like 1800 bucks to 2000. That's less than renting. The smart young person will do that. Yeah. But unfortunately, Instagram, highlight reels, TikTok would be like, living in a basement isn't sexy. And they won't. But the smart people will do it. But you could even, I mean, you could still buy that same property and rent out the basement and live upstairs. And the numbers aren't as n nice every month. But still, still better than not doing it, right? Still better than renting. Um, it will be more expensive than renting like a one-bedroom condo. But, yeah, more expensive, uh, but long term better. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course, right. of course. But like, okay. it also just depends. Like, if this person has to commute to work, like, are they really going to go into like the exurbs? Mm. Right. I That's kind of the main thing. Like, if you live, or sorry, if you work remotely, then yeah, for sure. Like, you can definitely do it. it. Makes a lot of sense. But if you have to be in the office three times a week, or potentially like five times a week, it's not going to happen. Traffic is horrendous in Toronto right now. Fake news. I heard it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, okay. <laughs> Who did you hear that from, Steve? Olivia Chow? Did she tell you that? You can just cruise right through there. You got all these different train options you can pick from. You can hop on a bus. You can do whatever you want. Super easy to get around. You can ride if a it's scooter, not, the bike lane, yep. maybe. Yeah, that's probably a little bit faster. Definitely. Well, let, me leave you, let me leave you with a final note here. So we have uh, formerly BC Transit TransLink here. And every week there used to be a story about how TransLink's making no money. Let me tell you one thing I noticed right now. The bus stops are jammed. Hmm. I have people, we only have one train here basically, right? So I have people that are talking about moving because they can't get a space on the train to get downtown to get to work. What? Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. And they're about to put in eight more stops. So there, there's, there's actually folks that are huh. talking about moving from like where the first stop is or where one of the third or fourth stops is to a closer stop to, to get the city to the last stop put a longer commute so they can get a so they can get a, a seat on the train every but, wait, but at what point do you want to move to the first stop and then you take the train loop around so you get a seat <laughs> that's it seems to be like that's legitimately <laughs> i wish it looped it's also a straight line our oh, train okay. sucks here too but, so now yeah, there's it, different levels of suburbs. Like there's there's suburbs one, there's suburbs two, three, four. It's like oh, you live in suburbs stop nine. Oh, that's that's really far away. Good luck getting a getting a spot. Or on the train. it's premium because you get a seat on the train. If you're like because you think about it, you're the furthest one out. Those are the ones that are starting in the morning, coming this way. Everybody True. gets on. If Everybody I ever get on. a listing that's like in belleville i'll be like you will be the first on the train to union <laughs> station <laughs> secure your seat every day so somebody's ass i hide it here oh here we go real real realtors realtoring again um all right zen that was fun man i appreciate you coming back thank you so much for doing this i know you're a busy guy and we appreciate you taking the time any uh any final words of wisdom to our loyal uh, followers of the podcast ah uh, well, just be smart whatever you're doing in real estate and get good representation who actually cares about you. Yeah. Um, and I think experience matters right now, but at the same time, finding someone who actually cares about like the outcome of what you're doing makes the most sense. And I can say like these two guys probably care, like I care, but if you get a bad sense from somebody, yeah, I don't see, look the way it's not you. <laughs> I don't know who you're talking about. <laughs> but yeah, like if you have someone who's just in it for a transaction, like just stay far, far away. You want someone who wants to build a relationship with you and yeah. actually look after you, right? Cause they will actually point out the pitfalls of, of all the pitfalls in this market right now. Great advice, you, Steve. And then you will fire them because they don't, you don't like what they're saying. Because <laughs> their price is too low. <laughs> price is too low. Or, or they come up with new realist or cancel. <laughs> yeah. no, I, I, hey, it's like, hey, guys, I don't think you should buy that place. Oh, I'm going to go find somebody that tells me it's a good idea to buy that place. There, There That's is a fine line for, for all of us between 
client saying they want to do something, you say you personally disagreeing, regardless of commission or anything else, just me thinking it's not a good idea and them saying, well, I'm going to do it whether it's with you or not. So mm -hmm. what do you want to do? It's that's I found is a very fine line over my career. That's that's hard to juggle, honestly. That's the it's line from uh, for this a line from Super Bad, right? All those girls, they're going to make mistakes with some guys in college, right? <laughs> we could be that guy. <laughs> Right, <laughs> I'm it's shocked like, you watched super bad. Well, well, then, then on that analogy, I'd be like, "Look, if you're going to do it, I can do it with you, but just like wear protection. You know, like you point out all the potential pitfalls <laughs> sure. of what could happen. But you're like, look, I'll do it, but this is what I see. And if they still want to go for it, that's fine. The relationship yeah. is okay, right? I yeah, think that's where wait to see this time. last two minutes cut up nicely online. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody, for watching. I hope you have a great day, and we will see you next week. Bye.